Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here every Thursday at 1130 talking about some really special use cases for how we can make use of Gig Performer. Um, I was actually just looking back over the last year at all the episodes we have had and it is pretty wild. It's kind of spanned from people who are doing cover band work uh, to people who are programmers to, I mean, it, the whole spectrum of guests. Um, we've had performance art come on and it's it's been a really wild and interesting time seeing all the ways people have um, taken a software that really allows you to do kind of whatever you want and put it to use and bring it on the stage and, um, you know, kind of let that stability champion your vision. Um, so thanks, guys, for tuning in for a full year of Backstage with Gig Performer. It's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Um Today will be our last episode for the rest of this year, um, but we'll be back in 2023 um, with more great stuff. But hey, today we are talking about um, GP Script largely, and we have a special guest, Michelle Kaijas, coming on, um, who is doing some incredible things with making his global rack space completely customized. Um, and we've talked through quite a few times uh you know, his vision. And I'm, I'm starting to understand why what he's doing is actually so brilliant. Um, and I think you are going to uh, see why it, it makes a ton of sense uh, as well. Um, me, myself, and I just popped on. He's a new gig performer user um, from Tampa. So happy to have you here. Um, hey, don't get freaked out by GP Script because you actually don't have to use this at all. Uh, so if you're a new user, uh, which you said you are, make sure you check out some of the foundational uh, series because this is definitely a highly specialized use case. And uh, we have whole groups of series uh, as well as a brand new article on our blog uh, just for beginners to get started and to feel really comfortable um, with the software. So um, I guess that's the one disclaimer as we begin to look through um, Michelle's set here. Um, Gig Performer is fully functional without any scripting at all. However, um, if you want to make something that is uh, a little bit outside of Gig Performer's standard functionality, um, you can do it. And also, if you want to make something that's a lot outside of its standard functionality, you can also do that. And that's actually what we're going to be checking out um, today. So if you've used GP Script before, can you go ahead and let us know in the comments um, how much you're using it and, um, you know, maybe a use case. Um, Dave, who is here almost every week, thanks, Dave, uh, has dabbled with GP Script and loves the flexibility it opens up. Yeah, it, it does make things possible, especially, you know, if you just need a little simple tweak here and there. Um, it's really, really great to have that ability. Uh, so we're going to keep monitoring those comments, but I want to bring uh, Michelle in uh, to talk about his life and what he does and how we've ended up here. So welcome, to the backstage backstage stream, uh, Michel. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, and hello everybody. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about your rack space that you're building. But um, for those of us who don't know you, maybe we're not in the forums and kind of haven't seen what you're doing. Who are you? What do you do during the day? Like, give us a little introduction. Who is Michel? Yes, I'm uh, Michel Keizers, uh, living in the Netherlands, uh, playing in uh, bands for about 30 years now, always uh, non-professional, so uh, just for hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, as a profession, I'm a software engineer, so I, uh, yeah, I like coding and uh, designing things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's why I got here. I, I used Corig for uh, about 26 of those years. Mm -hmm. Uh, starting with the X5 and ended with Kronos, yeah. which I used for about 10 years. But uh, since I have no doubt, of, I have some doubts about the Corus future, uh, yeah. I decided to try VSDs, which I never did before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a VSD was new and a VSD host uh, I never heard of until uh, three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how I uh, came up, uh, of I uh, found the gig performer. Yeah. Did you grow up playing in bands? Was that like just your whole life you've always been playing music? Uh, well, when I was like 12 years, I think, or 10, I got an organ, electric organ that was very popular in that time period. Okay. Uh, I did that a few years. Then I did five years, barely nothing. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I was 19, I think, or 18, I found some guy and we started a band with two. And then soon we had a complete band. And since then, I... Uh, 
I always stayed in bands. So, uh, yeah. I, it's fascinating to me. There's, there's such a connection between people who started with an organ and then people who continued on to be keyboard players rather than just piano players. Um, it's, a, it's a theme that's been coming up with people who are performing uh, in bands. Uh, so the, the organ that you got, is it something that people on the stream would know? Wh which electric organ was it that you were To be playing? honest, my first one, I think it was a gem, but it's very unknown brand. Yeah. And afterwards, it was a Farfisa that's probably more known to people. Yes. yes. Very, very cool. Okay. Well, I love that little tidbit. So you, you've been on Korgs, and when you started to be concerned about the future of the Kronos... You took to VST land. Did you start with Gig Performer or was there anything that you kind of passed through first? To be honest, I think I downloaded Counterball or something. I think Counterball. Yeah, yeah. But uh, actually, I only used it a few hours. It didn't work so well. So then I thought, what's more there? And then I saw a, a, a band, a band before, something that's for the Macintosh, but I, I don't have that, so I couldn't use it. Yeah. And then I found the gig performer, and yeah, from then on, it yeah, went quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So you and you're running on Windows, which we'll see in a second yes. here. So yeah. that is kind of a an interesting feature about gig performer is that it works well on both platforms. I shouldn't say both; yeah. there are other operating systems. But if you're using a Mac or you're using a Windows, gig performer I, works. I, I had a lot of trouble with pops and clicks in the beginning. Okay. And I was uh, blaming the laptop, and then I was blaming Gig Performer. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find out? Uh, I found out that my uh, audio MIDI interface was not good. Interesting. So I uh, changed it into a better one, and since then it's uh, almost uh, gone. I mean, if I get to 90% 90 or 80% mm -hmm. CPU, then it sometimes happens, but uh, yeah. yeah, now I know that. Yeah, very interesting. So it turned out to be your audio MIDI interface. I yes. feel like th oh, that can cause a lot of problems. Occasionally, I will have an issue with my interface where like sample rates switch while I'm using it, which is a really special <laughs> um, <laughs> feature. <laughs> it's a special feature. Um, all right, cool. So oh, you love the Kronos so much that a lot of what we're going to talk about today is inspired by the Kronos. So before we throw this on the screen, um, what is it about the layout of the Kronos that you loved so much? Like, what made you gravitate towards kind of copying that thought process? Well, actually, there are two things. Uh, one uh, thing that is typically for Korich is that they have a, a workflow that's uh, from the Korich M1 in 88 or something. Mm -hmm. It's about the same until the Kronos. So it's... Of course, things are added, but the workflow is very uh, easy. So if you go to a new Korig, it's very easy to use that uh, new uh, new uh, new Korig. Uh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the other, go ahead. And the other thing is that uh, I like that you have like a mixer uh, view with uh, like eight and uh, with the corner sixteen uh, uh, channels, and you can put instruments there. Mm -hmm. And also those instruments you can reuse. So if you use an organ. You can refer to that organ, and if you change something in that organ, it's everywhere uh, the same. So, yeah, that's also something that I like a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of the like global existence of particular things yes. has been, and it's been a part of your workflow for a very long time. Like you've been thinking yes, this that's... way for, I, I guess, is it 20 years that you've been in the Korg? atmosphere yeah, i think at 25 or something yeah. okay yeah so there's also something to be said which we're going to talk all about gig performer but there's also something to be said about like honoring the way in which you have learned how to think <laughs> yes. right it's, it's like you know retraining your thought process sometimes is more effort than just using it to your advantage um which i think is what we're doing here um M michael wrote in He's amazed by Gig Performer script capabilities and how people like Rank 13 use it. Love to see more documentation to help in learning. Um, and Marty Wade, who has been on backstage with us, is saying hello as well. Um, all right. So I think we should jump into your, your file. Are you ready to talk us through what's happening? Okay. Yes, I can. Sweet. So I'm going to add this to the screen. And by the way, if you're watching right now, uh, Michelle has written 
a very detailed outline of how he is creating this on the gig performer uh, community forum. So we're going to go through it and he's going to show all of this. But if you need like a more nuts and bolts because you're really curious about what he's doing, um, he generously wrote up a very detailed article with examples and um, a ton of clarity. So, um, all right. What are, what are we looking at, Michelle? Yes, uh, it's actually quite uh, some different things. Uh, yeah. This is the local rec space, which is completely empty. And uh, my intention is to... Uh, to only put there things which are really local for a song. So, uh, and I don't consider a, a Hammond uh, a, a specific for one song because I use it in many. So I used uh, Hammond in the global rec space. Mm -hmm. I'll come back uh, later to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using uh, a MIDI uh, foot controller, which has two pedals and a lot of switches, but the pedals I like to see here. So I, uh, I put them here as a widget. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I like to see the current time because normally on my laptop I use a full screen and then I don't see the time. So here it's uh, yeah, the current time and also the time from the song that we are playing. So uh, whenever I change the song, I can do that right now. If I go to the next song, <laughs> then you can see, ah, it doesn't work now. It should work, but it's broken, I guess. Sorry for that. Yeah, uh, okay. it, uh, it start counting. Uh, Oh, now it starts counting again. So this is helpful in rehearsal for you as well, right? Because you can kind of be like, oh, this song took yes, four minutes. Because, yeah, because we play uh, covers not always in the original uh, song layout. Sometimes we add something or we play it faster or slower. And then we know uh, at the end, like we spent so much time on the song. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which is just a good rehearsal tool. It's just information you should have. And so having something in there, um, which as it turns out, getting this to show up is actually a pretty simple script. Yes, you oh, are yeah, this is just a few lines of code. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Uh, keep talking us through. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, yes, this one is uh, for the, the speed of the rotor of the Hammond. Mm -hmm. I can uh, change this with the, with the MIDI foot controller. So whenever I uh, click that, it will uh, flip. Yep. Um, then these are some buttons. Um, maybe it's best if I show my setup yep. for a little while. Uh, here you can see the MIDI foot controller and the yes. two uh, pedals on the right. And the upper one is a MIDI oxygen. It's quite a simple keyboard, but it has nine sliders and uh, eight buttons mm -hmm. and eight uh, knobs. Yep. Now we'll put the big now. Okay. And I try to uh, mimic that here. So these are the nine sliders. These are the knobs. And those are some four ex extra knobs. And yeah, that's what I uh, So here, yeah, the slider, the, the knobs, I don't have a, a panel for that. So maybe I'm going to make that later uh, when I mm -hmm. want to use that. So do you, um, I know this is not necessarily like performance ready yet, but when you perform, I assume you like to be able to see your screen. Uh, yes, I have a laptop uh, normally, so... Uh, okay, so you're ab able to see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's the intention, because uh, later probably I want to have more uh, um, different functions for the buttons, so I want to have here also tabs, like I made here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whenever I press a button, I can change the function of the other buttons. Yes. Like on a real hardware synthesizer. Yes, um, which I think we were kind of connecting the dots earlier. At least I was. I mean, you you know this because you're building it, but I was kind of looking at this going, yeah, it like almost makes the global rack space work like a hardware control, a hardware uh, keyboard would work, where you there's like a lot of context for every change, where there are menus and um, and all of that stuff, which is is pretty cool. Um, I've not seen anything like this before, so it's it's pretty fascinating. And I want to point this out because even if you're not somebody who is using GP script all the time, I think there's a lot of um, value if you're somebody who likes the visual feedback of copying your keyboard. Because if it matches, there's a little bit less mental friction. Um, now, if you're not somebody who cares about the visual feedback, maybe it doesn't matter quite as much. But um yeah, it seems like you really appreciate it. And 
you've made a decision to mimic what you're physically seeing on your controller in in your buttons, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so those are the buttons. Show us what else we got going on here. Yeah, well, here we have the sliders. Uh, I have eight, uh, nine sliders on my uh, on my device. Uh, eight are for the the different instruments which I'm using or the plugins. Mm -hmm. And one is for the master, which is currently uh, not working. But yeah, I yep. talked with work in progress, so I'm constantly changing. Yes. And uh, I couldn't get uh, a previous version to work, so I just use uh, this one. Yeah. Um, what you can see here is the volume. So uh, while playing, I can change the volumes, mm -hmm. uh, which is useful because we play in a band where we have guitarists and they sometimes change things, and I also have to change the volume. So I want to do it on the fly. So here I can do that. And if I save it, then it will be saved. So if I go to another and back, then it should have the same uh, slider. So it, I can, uh, even though it's on the global rec space, I want to save it as if it's local. Yes. Gotcha. So, and, then, and this is all, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about this in a bit here, but this is all, you had to write code to make this happen. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes. Yep. Okay. And I also made uh, a volume of a level uh, slider. So if I play something. So, and you can see here the, the level metering. Yes. And with, if it's going too high, then you can see here a red uh, line. That means that it has peaked. So I know that the volume was too loud. And then I can uh, reduce the volume or change the instrument or something else. But typically, I uh, just lower the volume. And how how long does that stay? The, does it I just? Think, I think I put it to thirty seconds, but it's gradually going down. Uh, so it starts bold and it goes a bit, uh, bit less red until it uh, turns gray again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these things. Or, I mean, what's kind of cool about what's happening here is like this has a lot to do just with what you want to see as the performer. Yes, because in the rehearsal room, I change volumes to balance with the guitarists. Yeah. Uh, but I also don't want it to peak because then you get distortion and digital distortion is uh, yeah, it's not nice. Not very good. Yes. Not very so good. So now I can immediately say, hey, I got the peak. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, amazing. Um, what else on the front panel have we missed so far? I, if think, this, I think, well, uh, I can change the panel. So this is for the first eight channels and the yep. game uh, and the, the master. Uh, I have a button on my keyboard that I can press. Uh, ah, now it's right. Sorry for the... No, so it's okay. And now I go to the next step tab and I can go through it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have 32 channels because that's, I'm sure I never will use more than that. Yep. And then the next one is for the Hammond uh, settings. Gotcha. Now, this is I mean, the question that immediately pops into my head is um, where do the widgets go? <laughs> well yes. <laughs> I can show that if I. <laughs> If I go to edit and uh, sorry, go to wiring, then global rig space, and then edit, then you can see here all the widgets which I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can move some of them. And then you can, if I move the Hammond sliders, it's a bit tricky. But then you can see that the other sliders are behind it. Yes. OK. And you so can imagine, like, now it's a mess here because I did this. Yeah. And I recompile the script. And everything goes back to where it used to go. And then you can see the correct sliders again or the correct uh, widgets. <laughs> I love it. So I'm, I guess I'm assuming when you first started, you didn't know that you needed that. And at some point you realized that you needed that and you had to then write the code for it. Yes. The first time I uh, moved the sliders and I got fed up with it because it's, uh, yeah, there came more sliders and the level meter, so uh, yeah, I've got like now 100 widgets or more. Yeah. So then I thought I need to write something that uh, <laughs> that automatically uh, puts them here. And also, if I want, for example, later some pain here, then every the, these have to slide to the right. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, now I only have to change a few values and everything will be automatically uh, formatable. Yes. Yeah. You know, and the, the cool thing too with, with all of this is like, as you're building something, you're also discovering what you're building. It's sort of like yes. you're creating something and you have some idea of what it is, but it's like you're also discovering what you're creating. And yeah, I don't I don't have a plan like this is what I want in the end because probably it will forever changing. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I think sometimes stops people from starting. Like sometimes I think people don't get started because they feel like you know, yeah, they need to have a clear vision or something. To be, to be honest, I'm not using it currently in uh, my events. So mm -hmm. it's only on Wait. my... Uh, because it's too dangerous. I, not everything is working yet. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the, the the mixer works again and these things, then I, I can use it and I can add more screens or whatever I need. Yes. Yeah. Which is amazing. Okay. So I think we've got a a decent idea of what's going on on this first level. Um, can you, so are, are your piano and organ sounds working right now? Uh, yeah, but only if I do a little bit extra. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so if I, uh, let's go to this song. It doesn't update the sliders now. It should, but it doesn't. I see. I see. Okay. Now you can hear the Hammond. Yep. And also, you can see that the level is not working. Somehow, for for channel one, it, it doesn't work. I don't okay. know exactly why. Okay. And so, when you switch to a, a Hammond sound, is it by default that the drawbars appear, or you only want the drawbars in certain situations? Uh, in principle, it should do that, but I'm I'm doubting now because uh, maybe I'm going to make something that I can even define my own start screen, which I so I can select. I want for this song to see the draw bars, and mm -hmm. for that song I want to start with the with the faders. Yeah, awesome. But I want, but I want to make that if there is no organ uh, in that song, that it will not show this pain at all of this stuff. Yeah, but that's yeah. for future. Uh, sure. And then you were saying you kind of have not fully functional yet, but the beginning of a, a settings panel right below this. Is that true? Yes. Yes. So what what is the settings panel and what's the plan for how you're going to make use of this? What I want uh, for the for the local rec space, I want to add here items. So that's typically per song. Mm -hmm. But for the global rec space, uh, I want to make a setup, which is this uh, one, mm -hmm. which is specific for uh, for that song. So it's although it's in the global rec space, these are the channel names for that song. Gotcha. And the, and the organ settings and whatever I want. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, fascinating. Now, I asked you this question earlier, but I think it might be valuable for people to hear you answer it. So what is the benefit for you in having so many of these individual instruments in the global rack space rather than making more use of local rack spaces and local rack space panels? Um, yeah, when I started with a uh, gig performer, I, uh, I didn't know how, what would be a good workflow. So I just started to, to, uh, to put some plugins there and some audio mixers to combine them. And then I uh, found out it's easier to have one big 16 channel or 32 channel mixer. So I put that in all the rack spaces. And then I thought I need uh, to have these sliders uh, that would be nice to have. And I copied them, I made them in one song or one rec space and I copied them to all the others. And then I found out I want to see the expression pedals and I also had to copy them. So <laughs> I kept copying to all my uh, gig files or two gig files because I play in two bands yes. and in all the rec spaces. So yeah, that took a lot of time. Yeah. So I thought I want everything in a global rec space. Gotcha. And everything is not totally true based on what you've told me. Because you, what you, it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's only the sounds that are super commonly reused. And then the local rack spaces, you're using very specific sounds. Is that true? Uh, yes. Maybe I can uh, explain by showing the wiring diagram. Yeah. Yes, that's great. So for this, uh, this is a song where I use uh, two synthesizer sounds, which are uh, stacked, and a Hammond sound. And the Hammond sound you don't see here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
But what you can see here is I have two keyboards. So this is the MIDI in from, from the lower keyboard. Mm -hmm. They go to here, uh, use some small effects, and they go into this two global rec space mixer. Mm -hmm. If I go to the global rec space, I want to do as much as possible there. <laughs> it looks... Yes. Yeah, it, it looks a bit like a spider web, but it's simpler than you might think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here, uh, so here, the two uh, instruments, the, the synthesizer sounds come in in six and seven. Mm -hmm. They go to here, which is audio mixer channel, and this uh, mixer channel is coupled to the widget which I showed. Uh, sorry, which I showed here. So these are mapped. Gotcha. But gotcha. only for those channels which are currently active. Right. So if I go back to the global rec space again, so this is the main uh, volume mixer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I have another volume mixer because when I have, uh, I don't know if it works now, I have an expression pedal which I do with my MIDI keyboard. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yes, and I actually only two should change, but I program now four to be changed. Gotcha. So with one uh, pedal, I can change all of them. Gotcha. And um, assuming based on the way that you've set this up, this is not typical MIDI mapping. Like you've assigned that in GP script somewhere. Uh, yes, because uh, depending on uh, which uh, tab I'm in, I need to change different audio mixer channels. Right, right. Yeah. So, I, I, so I make the connection uh, inside GP script. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay, what else are we seeing here? Now, this entire uh, thing is for eight uh, possible uh, effect channels, which I can use. Okay. And these things are for ascent, the ascent effects, but it's not, yeah. It's, it not looks quite working yet. It's just all the same. It's just copied eight times. And, uh, mm -hmm. then, uh, is this um, for your send effects? Yes, exactly. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and everything is copied exactly each time, which there is kind of, there's a shortcut for this. Um, I think if you hold shift and right click, there's a copy with inputs um, oh, that would have menu. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. We'll have to, have to double check that one, but I'm pretty sure because uh, dragging all of these wires can take a lot of time, but that's, yeah, exactly. it saves you time. Okay. So this will be your eventual... No, I, I, actually, I'm not completely finished. So, uh, so those channels go uh, to here. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, to here. Uh, am I right? Yes, to here. And then uh, they come back at the local red space again. And here you can see that I now uh, use this uh, local effect for that effect, uh, that uh, send effect. So I can locally define which of which effect should be uh, active or not. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the workflow is going through the global rec space, but I can still, per song, I can define eight uh, effects which I want to use. Yes. Uh, then I also have these things, which are for the peaking, uh, for checking if a peak has been re reached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I go back to the set list and I... No, it's not, not peaking, but if I play it hard enough... And you can see it's becoming red. Yes. And for that, I used uh, uh, an audio to CC plugin. It's a free uh, plugin, and you can uh, change audio to uh, a MIDI uh, signal. Mm -hmm. And that I'm using to check if a peak has been reached. Yes. And now for the Hammond organ, which is here. Uh, so the Hammond organ I put in the global red space. I only want to have it uh, once in uh, yeah, all the songs that I'm using. And maybe later I want to use piano because I also use that quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is going to the red space. If I go back, then it's going to here. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, uh, and it's coming from the global red space. It's going to here. Yep. And then it goes back into the sorry to the red space again. And it ends up here as channel one. So, yeah, it's automatically, uh, uh, yeah, going through the local rec space if I want. Yes. So, yeah. So it's just, it gives you the ability to do anything at any point in the signal chain. Yes, I want to have it. Uh, I want to have it as flexible as possible, so I can 
make changes in my local rec space, even for the Hammond or the piano, if I want. Right. Right. Which I think is actually pretty, a pretty common need. You know, you might only use one or two pianos, but depending on the song, you might want a massive chorus on your piano, or you may want it to be verbed out or have a filter on it or whatever. And that might be on a per song basis. And also the benefit of this is if I want to have this Hammond and I decide in the, uh, in a few, uh, maybe in a year that I want to have uh, like this one a bit higher, mm -hmm. then I only have, oops, maybe this was not a good idea. Oh, it works. It was uh, just loading the plugin, probably. Yep. Yep. Uh, if I do this, then it will be uh, automatically for all the organs. So I only have to do it once, and all my songs will use the new setting. Right. And if I don't want it, I put it, I switch it in my local rec space and I override it. So I can use both ways. Yes. Yes. And um, we have a question coming in from Michael who wants to know, is there ever an issue where a large script would cause latency or something else? Well, you can see here that the latency is now 20%. Uh, and I think I can... Well, be David is shaking his head. David is shaking his head. No. Do you... Do you do you want to come on and talk about that or no? Yeah. How's it going, David? Hey, that's not, <clears throat> that is not a measure of latency. Okay. Well, um, that is a measure of how uh, much of the CPU is being used to process audio. Okay. Okay. It has nothing to do, it, it has nothing to do, you know, the latency is defined by your sample buffer divi divided by the um, the sample rate, yes. uh, plus whatever your audio interface gives you, which is something, of course, you can actually measure with Gig Performer. Mm -hmm. um, so I just I just wanted to clear that up. That that's just a measure of how how much your CPU is being used for the audio processing. In that case, I think it's really used quite less because the most things I do is like setting up things and. The yeah, only thing I do live at all won't affect latency at all. Yeah, yes, only the peaking uh, distance might be a bit because I every time check it, but no, uh, um, it, the, it, it still won't affect latency because the GP script oh, yeah. is running on a separate thread with its own scheduler, and the the audio as long as you don't do anything, <clears throat> uh, there's very little you can do to actually hold up audio processing no. audio processing will still go at high priority mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so for example if what you could do where you could impact delays if you had something in a gp script to send out a midi event and you got very busy doing something you could delay sending out a midi event mm -hmm, but yeah. you know that's any real-time system it's like don't do that right uh, you know basically but this is all configuration will have no, no impact on on the speed at which audio is being processed. I, yep. I used to send now sometimes because I need to uh, to gather sometimes a note and send it to where I want it. But right. Yeah. So for so for example, one way you could impact not not so much latency, but just a delay because a MIDI event doesn't go out as soon as you want it, is if you do stuff that's really not intended to be used during real time, such as a, a significant string processing. Mm -hmm. which is never a good idea in, in a real-time system. If you're like concatenating strings and it's allocating memory on the fly, but you generally wouldn't be doing that while you're actually manipulating MIDI and audio. Exactly. And then, I, I use uh, string manipulation, but I only use it to switch between songs. And right. You, yeah, that's not going to have any effect. Uh, yes. So uh, also what, uh, what you, you told me that... Uh, when I change songs, I have a little bit glitch, and that's because of my file I.O. Uh, which, of yeah. course, of time. File I.O. is even worse than string I.O., so... Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I mean, all bets are off when you start doing um, things like that. It might make sense in a future version of Gig Performer, and we'll talk about this uh, some other time, to have an in-RAM file uh, thing where stuff can be stored and 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 uh, recovered without actually going to your hard drive or your SSD. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we can talk about that in the future. There's yeah. always something new to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks, Thank David. You. While you're here, just something you said to me that really made everything click. And you correct can correct me if I'm wrong. 
is that GP script accesses everything so directly, like the closest way possible, that the things that it's able to do feel instant because there's no gap between the script and the item itself. Did I well, hear that correctly? Well, kind of. So one of the things when, 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 when we decided to do GP script, uh, which is something I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, there's, a, there's other hosts out there do have scripting languages. Like I think main stage has some version of JavaScript, mm -hmm. you know, you know, gag me with a spoon, mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's JavaScript. But, uh, and, and uh, there are things out there that use Lua and other languages that are, that are related to C and even Python, some things use. The trouble with those systems is you've got to do this extra level of binding to connect something with a string name to something in your system. And it gets very messy. The idea behind GP script, um, and, and some of it comes from my own background in language design, which is what I used to do for a living, um, is I wanted to make this easy for you when you declare something like I've got a widget. Um, it's not going to let you perform operations that don't make sense for widgets. Right. And because of that, uh, the way it's done, when you declare the widget, uh, the widget or a plugin, uh, this, the runtime system will tie that directly to the underlying object mm -hmm. um, um, before you start doing anything. So when you basically do a call to, for example, set the widget value to like 0.5, you know, that message, if you will, is going directly to the widget. There's very little in between. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, to make it be very, to make it be as efficient as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was super helpful for me. I appreciate you sharing that, David. And thanks for, sure. uh, for popping in. I also want to say that I also try to, uh, to keep the widget in place as a, in between, between the actual MIDI and the controller, because that's the official way to do it. Well, that's a key. Yeah, I mean, that that's one of the key things. Um, and and uh, I think new people coming on board who have a lot of experience with MIDI and with other platforms that don't really have this concept, and they tie MIDI directly to plugins. Mm. The whole idea of having that widget in between, apart from the fact that you can do all sorts of scaling and grouping and everything, is that you're basically independent of MIDI. So. You're, you know, even if your plugin doesn't support MIDI Learn, uh, any, uh, you, you can just map widgets using host automation, which is the modern way to do it. And then when you change controllers and you have to use different MIDI messages, you don't have to start worrying about reconfiguring your controller to make sure that it's still sending out the MIDI message. Mm -hmm. um, this comes from experience touring. I, I was in Japan. I was supposed to, uh, on, on tour with one of my bands. I was supposed to get certain keyboards. Well, guess what? They gave me three completely different keyboards than I was expecting. Um, and basically what I do, I don't want to learn how to program those things like at a sound check just before we go on stage. But basically factory reset and learn whatever the thing sends out. Um, uh, and then just use those. And because you're using widgets in between, you do not have to worry that it might be sending different MIDI messages um, to your plugins. You don't. You just don't have to worry about that. Yes, the my only case. exception is the sustain pedal 64, and the reason for that is, believe it or not, there are quite a few plugins out there that do not support a sustain as a host automation parameter, which is very annoying. Mm. Um, I, I have the problem that I, uh, for the Hammond, for example, it uses. 64 by default, and I don't want that. So I'm intending to use another CC, uh, sending by my foot pedal, and convert that to a sustain. Well, you can remember, well, a lot of Hammonds don't even support uh, sustain because you're not supposed to be able to sustain Hammond. And no, of no, course, it's, it's a sustain for changing the, the rotor speed. Oh, well, that's, that's completely different. Mm -hmm. yes. But by the way, I, just as an aside while we're at it, um, one of the things I – somebody in the user, <laughs> one of our – users um, wrote a, a scriptlet um, to support sustain for Hammond organs that don't actually support sustain. Mm. Uh, so you could do some really cute stuff um, mm -hmm. if you want your organ to sustain. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Nope. nope. Thanks no for coming on, David. Appreciate it. So I think the moral of the story 
is that GP script is not affecting or causing any extra latency. It works. It's very snappy and it feels quick. Yeah, the only um, thing is that uh, between uh, changing songs, I have a uh, I have a small glitch, and that's mm -hmm. uh, because every time when I change it, I uh, it needs to read the all the new values which I store in a file, which you can see here. So all this information is then <laughs> stored. Sure, sure. So, and I will just say for clarity, like if you build a setup using no coding at all, all of that is completely instant. Um, this is kind of a unique to your uh, use case. Um, okay, so talk to us a little bit. Uh, I I can't actually remember where we just got cut off. Um, you were showing all of the effects. You can affect anything at any point in the signal chain. Um, and yeah. then was that it? Is that where we were? Uh, yeah, and I also talked about the, the sorry, the Hammond. Uh... Yes. So here, so here is the yeah the, the the global instruments. I want to put them here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they are uh, then also going to the rec space and from the rec space. So from rec space they go to uh, sorry uh, to here and then yeah they go uh, back to the signal. Uh, sorry, they go back. Something I do wrong. Uh, Which, what, what, are you, what are you looking for? Yeah, for this. Then yeah. everything goes here, and then it goes through the signal chain again. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, quite flexible to uh, to use effects or uh, instruments wherever I want. I can put them here. I can put them locally. Uh, yes. So and, something you're doing a lot of um, is showing and hiding widgets. Yes. And a foundational concept of GP script is this um, thought process of a callback, which is when this thing happens, do this thing. Yes, exactly. Right? So the actual parameter for showing and hiding widgets is really not that complicated. Um, it's a pretty simple thing. So if somebody yes. was watching um, and wanted to perhaps have a widget show or hide, is there a bit of script you could show us? Uh, from your uh, thing where you deal with hiding something. I'm sure it's much more complex um, yeah, yeah, in yes. your particular use case, but um, so, so that's, that's a pretty simple one. I'm wondering if that's something you could show. This is my entire script. This is quite long, but uh, yeah. <laughs> there is one... Let me search. Oh, there it is. Uh, set widget fill color. Yeah, so this is uh, how to fill, to change the color of a... Uh -huh. I might be in the next version, so... Uh, okay. Uh, I'm checking for... Yeah, this is a function which I wrote myself. Gotcha. And uh, I have a, uh, this template where I put all the, the generic things. And I have Sweet. a show widget. And I can put here an array of, uh, of elements. So I can uh, say, make all the sliders uh, invisible. Mm. So I uh, pass the array and then this method set widget height on presentation yep. that you can use for hiding or uh, showing a uh, widget. Yep. So it's it's um it's really like I I mean it's not plain English but it kind of is plain English like there's no weird wording in there. Set widget height on presentation does what you think it's going to do. Yeah, and this is a bit cryptic, but normally you write here just the name of the widget. Yep. And then uh, with this, you can uh, I, I uh, you can put true or false actually. Yes. I pass it, but uh, if you use set widget height on presentation uh, slider comma true, then it will be hidden because yes. it's hiding by default. Yes. Um, so it's it's something that can really be done by anybody who yeah. can can read a manual. I mean, there there is documentation and it's designed to be in plain English. So if if you can, you know, do some problem solving, um, it's it's really quite accessible and it's scalable too. I'm gonna pull you in, David. So if you um, want to make something possible and we also have great support on the forum as well. Uh, welcome, David. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make another comment there. Yeah. Another piece of why GP script 
which by the way should not be called script because it actually is a compiled language, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, I, I come from the Pascal world, yes. not the C world, even though I've done a lot of in both. And I, I really wanted this to be accessible by people who aren't deeply experienced. Yes. Um, so, for example, if you use any of these other languages, and anybody here who who's, who is a programmer will know this, if you want to use something like Python or JavaScript for callbacks, you've got to go to a lot of work to basically write your function call and add in all this stuff, basically say, this is something that's going to be called back. And then the callback looks just like another function. So it's like you look at a piece of code. Well, wait a minute. Do I call that or does the system call that? Mm. And I've never liked that concept. And so GP script was designed to have a completely different syntax for things where the system calls you versus you call system to make it clearer. This is what's happening here. Um, we're calling you. You're not calling us. So that's why they don't just look like functions, which mm -hmm. is what most other languages do. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that, David. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Michelle, you opened the documentation, which can be done right from inside Gig Performer, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, there are two pages. One is about the language and one is about the functions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the functions, I only check for reference. And the other one, uh, yeah, you have to read once to know what's uh, what's possible. Yes, yes. Um, and I, am, I have no coding experience at all. Um, and in the actually in the gig file that I use every day for teaching piano lessons online, I use a decent amount of scripting um, because I want, you know, things to work a particular way. And I was able to do it. Um, David did help me a little bit, but largely just by reading what's what's available. There's a, there's you know, you have to read a little bit. But as you're, you're showing there, I mean, it's it's all it's there. It's available for you. Yeah, it's just uh, searching for the functions in the beginning. There's a. A list of uh, where they are grouped so it's quite easy to know uh, what is available and what is not yep yep and a, uh, yeah, a lot is available because my entire script i could uh yeah i could uh, write using all these functions here mm -hmm. um the 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 script that you wrote is quite robust uh how yes. how many lines of code have you ended up with so far to create this i think i have like 200 2,300 lines. Okay. And yeah. actually, I should also add this because these are the, the simple add additional functions. So like 2,400. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And uh, I think 700 of them are for rearranging the widgets because that's uh, that's only one line to to map a widget. But uh, yeah, for, uh, I used a quite smart way where I group all the widgets so I can, uh, you can see here some constant. So if I change one constant, it can rearrange a complete uh, pain. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you who are watching right now, if you have any questions for Michel about what he's doing, um, go ahead and throw that in the chat because um, Michel's an, an expert. I mean, he's really writing something quite tremendous here. So any questions, I, pop, I them, have, pop them in. Go ahead, Michel. I have to say that there are a few people who are more, uh, much more experienced, like yes. Rick and uh, some others. So, uh, yeah. But I, uh, in the beginning, I, I really have a lot of uh, a lot of questions, and they really answered very fast, and even with examples. So I learned a lot of them uh, yes. from them. Yeah. Um, the forum continues to far exceed um, the level of anything else I've really seen. Um, on the internet. So I know there are some guys on there um, who are amazing, amazing coders, um, especially in uh, in GP script and in, in everything who are really helpful, but not just helpful, really fast to respond, um, which which is great. Um, okay, have we, what else have we missed anything else from this uh, from this setup so far? Um, no, I think not. We, uh, yeah, we, I can go to the panels. I have mm -hmm. buttons which I can later change. Uh, yep. Pedals. Probably there will come more, but yeah, it will be uh, in time. So uh, yes, for Absolutely. me it's only a hobby, so I can only spend a few hours per week uh, on this. Yes, yes. Um, so I I asked you this earlier, um, 
but I want to kind of ask for everybody who's watching um, if somebody was trying to get started and they were trying to write some sort of a code um, because they needed some functionality they couldn't find other ways. um, What would you recommend for somebody who's brand new to GP script that doesn't have the background in coding that you have? What would you say to them? Actually, first I would ask if is there already another way to do it? Because uh, a lot of people, they don't want to use GP script, but they want something that they think is not possible, but it mostly, or it can be possible. And mm. uh, I also got things that uh, people said, you can also use it this way. So mm-hmm. otherwise my script would be even larger than how it would be now. So uh, yeah. the first thing is like, if there is a non-GP, it's on, sorry, a non-GP script way, Yes. Uh, but if you want to start with it, I suggest uh, read the documentation or at least uh, scan through it mm-hmm. and read examples from people who already made uh, examples and not start with uh, a difficult one, but just with a few lines. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then just uh, try things uh, simple, like uh, don't, uh, don't make a very large skit and start testing. Just use a few things, test it and see if it works. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I found out if I use just a few lines or just small, some small things, then you, your knowledge about how to use it goes and that affects how you continue. Yes. So yep. start simple and then, uh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. I love the tip about um, the best way to get started with GP script is to find out if you don't need to use it. Um, I, I think that's exactly correct. Because I think a lot of times it's not needed, um, you know, but then sometimes there are cool things. You know, another thing um, for those of you who are watching is we have uh, at this point a quite robust collection of um, pre-made rack spaces that you can download. Um, and there's a whole section of scriptlets. Um, and there are a couple of scripts as well in there. So if you want to see a functioning um, gig file that has some scripting in it, you can open things up and um, and look around and see how they're working, which I think can be super useful. Um, bringing David on. How's it going, David? Hi. Uh, sorry, it's probably worth mentioning at this point, you brought up script libs, um, yes. just for people to understand. So historically, scripts are things that you can tie to a rack space, and each rack space can have its own script. There can be another script in the global rack space that can be a script for each song, um, and there's also something called a gig script, um, which can really be used for low level uh, input, uh, changing MIDI coming in, for example, if you need to reverse the polarity of the pedal and so on before the system sees it. Mm-hmm. But scriptlets, which are relatively new, are a whole different concept, which actually Nabogia suggested that mm-hmm. idea. And the idea is you can write little scripts that basically behave as plugins complete with you can define parameters in gp script you can attach widgets to them and you can basically uh use a scriptlet the way you use a lot of other plugins yes. so that's the port and there's a lot of as you mentioned there's a lot of pre-made um scriptlets the auto sustain which is one of my favorites one of the earliest Mm -hmm. one which is great for like playing a chord it's like latching and it will keep the chord on until you play another chord so you don't need to use a uh, a pedal great for pink floyd songs where you need to hold a chord for four minutes um (laughs) seriously that's what i use it for yeah Um, so i just wanted to uh it's useful for people to understand the difference between traditional scripts that are in rack spaces and the scriptlet, which is basically a user plugin, mostly for manipulating MIDI, uh, but you can do other cute things with it. Yeah, thanks for that, David. Um, actually, Michelle, that kind of brings up a question that I have that perhaps you can show, which is where does your script live? Yes, I uh, was showing. Uh, <laughs> this is my local uh, script, so it's completely empty. Yeah. This is my global uh, script, and the reason is that. Uh, I don't like the editor so much. I mean, it's a good editor for small uh, scripts, but uh, if your script is like 2,000 lines and I need to find something, then I want to have an editor where I can search, for example, or replace or whatever. So I just include this one and I use, uh, for now, Notepad. Notepad++, it's uh, free, and you can uh, do it here. 
and I said the language to Pascal, which is a little bit, uh, yeah, looking like uh, the CP script uh, functionality. So I have a little bit of uh, coloring here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that works for me. So you are just telling GP script to read the code you wrote in a file. Well, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, do that, yes. Yeah, and does the, in order for that to work, do you need to have the file open when Gig Performer is running? Uh, no, it only needs to be in the, in the directory of the GP script, the directory of a Gig Performer, so. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, this is fast, yeah, I didn't even know that was possible. This is very cool. Know, uh, all these songs needs to be in a specific directory, but that's only for my script. That's, uh, gotcha. Um, and th that's a list of all of your channels. So uh, that other thing you just showed, that's a list of all of your like widget. Uh, uh, th these are all the properties which are specific for one rec space. Gotcha. So the, if they are uh, active or not, the name, uh, the volume, the, the source, if they are on upper lower, also the trailbar settings. Mm -hmm. uh, the rotation of the rotor speed, which I want to have different, and the uh, settings for uh, the split of the keyboard. But this will grow uh, probably in half year, it may be many hundreds of lines. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Very, very interesting. Okay, cool. And uh, also, maybe what I uh, did I, um, for the callbacks, uh, Dave mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the buttons, and I um, give them very ge generic names. And here I uh, connect them to a specific functionality. So, so button eight is now uh, checking the the, the peak uh, if, a, if a peak has been reached. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm using the wrong uh, example. No, it's okay. Uh, do I have a better one? Some button that rests. Yeah, for example, uh, this button, it's for a metronome. I didn't show it, actually. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's enabling a metronome, so I can uh, know if I'm on the right speed. Mm -hmm. And here I say, if I press this button, I want to see it in the lock screen because I like to see that it's working. And then the metronome becomes active or not, and then it goes out of it. But later, when I want to have one widget doing two things, I can make here an if statement in between, and I can say... If this panel is active, I want to do this, and otherwise I want to do something else. Yeah. So it's yeah, quite flexible. Yeah, and once you sort of have the ability to say if this, then that, um, things that the whole world opens up, right? Um, yes. Which is, I assume, what's happening with all of your buttons here, where if you click something, a bunch of other things happen, and then depending on what's selected, different yeah, things. Yeah, not, not, not right now, but for example. Uh, well, if I, yeah, there is one button, uh, the next pane button. I go to the next one. So here I can say, change the tabs and make the sliders different. And yeah. also the when the slider is changed, depending on which tab is active, it also needs to do different things. Yes. Yep. And, then, uh, and then I map it uh, to a MIDI uh, or to a plugin or whatever I want or some functionality. And then, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Um Oh, this is awesome. Uh, have we missed anything or have we covered it all? I want to make sure people get the fullest uh, insight possible. Yeah, I see. It's uh, always changing. So in three months, it will look uh, different <laughs> than now, probably. I yeah. want to, uh, I have the intention to uh, to uh, occasionally upload it, but I'm not going to do it all the time. So yeah, once every few months, then I probably will upload it for others if they are interested. Um, also, um, not to start a completely new topic at the very end of our time, but um, anybody who is using uh, Korg Kronos, you also wrote a, a program that's available for download. Um, can you tell us what that does? And, and the link is in the description. Um, what was the purpose of that program that you wrote? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm a bit uh, confused now about oh, the question. You, sorry. You, sorry, you wrote the, um, for the Korg Kronos, you made a little bit of software. Oh, yes. And what, what is it that it does? What's the um, purpose? If you have a Kronos, then uh, you have a banks with sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a bit different than uh, plugins because mm -hmm. I was completely new to plugin, but in Kronos, you have banks and every bank has 128 uh, 
programs, and a program is like a, a, a VST instrument. Gotcha. So you have like a thousand of them, a few thousand of them, and you in a rec space, which is called a combi, you can refer to that. And I was a bit uh, not disappointed, but I lacked some functionality on the Corriconos. So what I wanted is to, to be able to sort them, for example, or to be able to take a program out of it and put it in another uh, gig file of what is a gig file for Konos. Yes. So that program can, it's like a librarian for, uh, for Corey Konos. Yes. So your scripting journey was even occurring in the Kronos. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes. Which is very, very cool. But so, the, only, and, go the ahead. downside was I, there I couldn't change the hardware because the, the, the software or the firmware is inside the Corey Konos. And with Gig Performer, which is actually now my synthesizer or my yeah, my, my platform, I can really uh, do everything I want. So it's much more flexible than a hardware synthesizer. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the flexibility is really helpful because as things change, you can update a piece at a time and it, it uh, it's a very smooth transition. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the link for that is in the description. Um, there is a link in the comments right now to your article, but I'll move that down to the description so people can grab it. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate your time. Um, everybody who's watching, uh, thank you guys for being here. We will be back uh, on January 7th. Um, will be our next episode, which is an unusual day because it's a Saturday, which we typically don't do, but we've got... Um, uh, Mike Lopez coming on to show how he's using Gig Performer um, for worship music, and he's doing some cool things also with the Global Rack Space. So, um, Merry Christmas for those of you who celebrate. Happy New Year. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you all in a couple weeks.